The pulpit committee was having a difficult time making a decision about a new pastor. One member on the committee who was tired of the entire process offered one last resume, and this is what he read to the pulpit committee. It is my understanding that you have a vacancy, and I would like to apply for the position. I can't say that I preach too well. In fact, I tend to stutter when I speak. I do have a lot of experience I could share with you since I'm over 75 years old. I've recently had an encounter with God, and despite my initial resistance to the idea, I heard a voice which told me that I was the one to do the ministry for you. As far as people skills go, I do tend to lose my temper every once in a while. I also tend to want things done my way and can get violent if it's not taken care of right away. Once I even killed somebody. But since I know you are gracious people, I know you will believe me when I say that's all behind me now. I intend on showing up there in a few weeks to lead you into a brighter future. The man who read the letter looked at the rest of the group and asked, well, what do you think? Can he be our pastor or what? One committee member said, have an old, arrogant, temperamental, uh, obviously neurotic ex-murderer as our pastor. Who signed the resume? The one who read the resume said, Moses. Stand with me in honor of the Word of God in Exodus chapter 3. <clears throat> God has a plan. He has a plan for your life, my life. He has a plan for our church. And I'm so glad he is the leader of that plan. Verse 1 says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the, the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush, and he said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Pray with me again, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, that you have allowed us to come together one more Sunday. I thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. I thank you that it is sharper than a two-edged sword. I thank you, Lord, through the Holy Spirit that people right here today are going to be convicted of sin. And I pray each one of us will come to that point in our life and we will say all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. I pray as a church body that, Lord, we will not keep looking back. We will look forward because there's so many great days ahead in our lives and for this church right here in Hickory With. Thank you, Lord, for the life of Moses and for what you did in his life. And I pray that you will speak to every one of us that, Lord, we will go out of this building today fully committed fully surrendered just to you, that we might make a difference, Lord, in the areas of life where we live. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the man Moses did not seem like a person that would receive a call from God, did he? 
this morning there is a call to everybody in our church to surrender everything to Christ and to follow him. Last week we talked about Peter. And you will remember there in John 21, Jesus said, Peter, it doesn't matter what happens to anybody else. All I want you to do is to follow me. We need to understand this morning as a church body that everybody here is important. Everybody here who has been saved by the grace of God, God has given you a job to do. He wants you to get right in the middle of that plan he has for you. And you say, preacher, you don't really know what I've done in my lifetime. Well, it doesn't really matter. You were created by God, and we know that the Bible says so. And if you are a Christian, the plan, the will of God for your life is so very important. You are important to him. You're part of this family, and because you are here this morning, he is not finished with you yet. It does not matter your age. Now, some of you who I'm speaking to this morning, you may be new in the Lord, and that means that you have only been saved for a short while. Some of you may have been saved for a long time, but think about your life right now and see how far you have come since you have been born again. I'm looking at some people today, and you've been saved a long time. There are some new babies in our church, and aren't you glad? But we as the people of God need to come to that, to that road in our life, that stop sign in our life, and realize that God has something right now for us to do, and we don't need to do it two weeks or two months or two months down the year or two years down the road. We need to do what God has for us this morning. Well, some have been saved a long time, and I can see some people, as they're going around the track, they're barely walking. Can you see them? There's somebody, they're running the race that God has given to them. And there's some people who have pulled over and parked, and they're sitting on a bench on the side of the road, and they're just waving to people as they go by. Charles Stanley said in his book, Confronting casual Christianity, and I quote, Most of God's people have made a decision about Jesus, but never have surrendered it all to Him. Now, why is it this morning that we are so hesitant in giving every bit of our life to the Lord Jesus Christ? We know beyond any doubt that when we give our best, he's going to give his best back to us, and he will not ever lead us the wrong way. So why today, in a church like this, and God the Holy Spirit may be speaking to you, why are we hesitant to hold back a 5% or 10 or 25% of our life? Looking at the life of Moses, as I've been studying his life this week, I discovered that he is a man that, and we are like him in so many ways, a man with weaknesses that he had. Can you look at your life right now and say, you know what, preacher, I've got some weaknesses in my life. A man dealing with his own sin. It would amaze us that we try to come to church and we try to worship a holy God with sin or sins built up in our life. We deal with sin every single day from the moment we get up until the time we go to bed in the evening, and we must deal with that sins just like Moses did a long time ago. A man who had failures. Aren't you glad today that even though we fail, God is always there to help pick us up and keep us on the straight and narrow? A man who gives over, he was a man who gave over to anger. Has anybody been angry this week? A man sometimes in rebellion. But yet here is a man who is considered 
in the Word of God is one of the greatest men in the Old Testament. A man whose name is mentioned some 750 times in Scripture. More than 30 books in the Bible mention the name of Moses. A man, listen to this, who had the unique privilege of being the first person to receive Scripture and recording it. Wow, that is amazing to me. Now, when you look at the life of Moses, he lived to be 120 years old. You can divide his life into 340 different segments, 40 years. The first 40 years he spent as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, and we all know that story. The next 40 years, as a result of two things, of impatience and then also of anger, he was on the backside of nowhere. In other words, in the penalty box of God. Have you ever been put in the penalty box of God? And friends, sometime God is, if you're there, he'll take out the switches and he'll take you to the woodshed and let you know what you're doing wrong. Then he spends the last 40 years as a great leader of the nation of Israel. Now, I have three quick points for you, and the first one is the word introduction, along with what we've been doing. Moses was born into a world where his people are oppressed. The king, as you remember, he ordered the Hebrew midwives to kill all the Hebrew baby boys. The midwives, thank the Lord, they did not obey the orders of the Pharaoh. Pharaoh was afraid of the boys when he should have been afraid of the midwives. In Exodus chapter 2, people were, they were still falling in love and they were still having babies. There was one couple who had a little boy and first thing that came to their mind what will happen to this child? Because Pharaoh was saying, we need to throw the baby boys into the river. The child's mother, as you know the story, put him in the river, but, he put, but she put him in a basket. It was Pharaoh's daughter, and I find this so amazing. It was Pharaoh's daughter who disobeyed her father. Why were the children of Israel in Egypt in the first place? Well, they were slaves there, weren't they? And the promised land was 300 miles away. Now, if you were going to walk 300 miles, what kind of shoes would you want? I mean, they did not have all the modern brand shoes that we have today. But what kind of shoes would you want if you were going to walk 300 miles? If you knew along the way of those 300 miles, there were going to be a lot of snakes and scorpions, then what kind of shoes would you want? Friend, this world we live in right now is like a desert full of snakes and full of scorpions. Remember when you got saved? Remember when you started your walk for the Lord Jesus Christ? Many times we've got to walk over things, don't we? Sometimes we come to a roadblock and we got to turn around. And we zig and zag all the way through. But thank the Lord, if we are filled with his Holy Spirit, he will always guide us in the right direction. Now, during this time, mankind had not learned the lesson from the flood. In the upcoming years, the Bible says knowledge of the true God was being passed down from generation to generation. And should I say this, we need to be, we need to be embedding into the hearts and minds of our children and grandchildren the ways of God. Friend, we think it's rough in America right now. Wait until 25 years down the road if Jesus hasn't come yet. Our children and our grandchildren, they need the ways of God embedded into their very life. God wanted to grow one special nation. 
So God called Abraham, and Abraham had Isaac and Jacob. Jacob turned around and had 12 boys. Wow. God moved then, and God moved them and their wives to Egypt. There was a dynasty change in Egypt, and the new Pharaoh enslaved the children of Israel. Now, secondly, the second point of the message is that Moses had had a lot of trouble, hadn't he? But he was just minding his own business. That is in chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Moses, the Bible says, was tending sheep, minding his own business when he encountered God for the very first time. Now, Moses didn't go on a special retreat to experience God. We feel like sometimes we got to run off to a retreat. We've got to go to some special seminar in order to get in touch with God. The best way to get in touch with God is just to get in touch with God through the Word of God. I mean, just you and Him, and you don't need anybody else. He was just keeping the flock of his father-in-law. No one was chasing after him. He was watching sheep that were not even his. And, you know, I, I thought there is sort of like grandparenting you just keep them alive when they come over. I mean, you feed them some candy, you watch a movie with them, and then you just send them back the way they were. Now, look with me in verse 2 of chapter 3. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. God put the bush there to get Moses' attention, and guess what? He got it. Yeah. Look at verse 3. Moses said, I will not turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, said it twice. Now, the repeated name like that is not unusual in Scripture. Repeated name signal an especially important moment in God's dealing with humans. I want to give you a couple of examples. In Genesis chapter 46, it says the name of Jacob twice. In 1 Samuel 3, it says the name of Samuel right there twice. In Luke 22, it says, Simon, Simon. And then in Acts 9, it says the word Saul twice. All that was said in the scripture in Genesis chapter 3. And Moses said, here I am. Now, Hickory with Church, I want to know from you. Are you ready today to say, here I am? just like I am right now, Lord, and I, wanna, I would like for you to make something wonderful out of my life for the kingdom of God. So each one of us must say that. Moses, when he said, here I am, he is announcing, he is announcing this, that I am listening very carefully. You have my undivided attention. Now, I remember when I was in the sixth grade, it was the second time, at Sherwood, at Sherwood Elementary. You remember those desks we used to sit in? I remember one day the teacher, her name was Mrs. Theobald. And she was teaching very sincere, but I went to sleep with my head down on the desk. I'll never forget it as long as I live. She came back there. You know those yardsticks? She broke that yardstick right over my back. I sat straight up in that chair, and she had my undivided attention. <laughs> Moses, God had his undivided attention. Hey, Hickory, with church, God wants you to focus 
on him, to focus on his will for your life, to focus on what he wants you to do right now at this time. Why did God use a burning bush? That's a good question. And why was Moses afraid to look at it? Listen, God's wrath burns against sinners. The problem for Moses and us is we are sinners. You know what? People don't like to hear that today. They don't like to hear that they're wrong and they're living wrong and doing wrong and treating wrong. They don't like to hear that. Now, we go to work sometime and it gets very frustrating sometimes. For us. Why is there, we ask questions like, uh, why is there so much pain in our relationships? Why are there earthquakes and wars and diseases? Friend, I look at the world we're living in right now, and all these things, God is showing a wrath because of sin. See, we do not need to offend God any more than we already have. God anger burns so much for our little sins as it does for our bigger ones. And I found this as I was reading this this week. Only when God so saw that Moses had turned and looked did God call out to him. Do you know today that we can miss God's calling if we don't turn around and look and pay attention to the burning bushes that might be all around us? And there are many at times. But Moses does turn and look. And God calls his name and God says, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. Hickory with church, we need to take our shoes off, don't we? See, we belong to God. That's our identity. And wherever we are right now, that makes us at home. Now, notice something very important here. The fire of the burning bush is never mentioned again. God is not here today for a magic show, and he wasn't there for a magic show. God goes straight to the heart of the matter when he says these words to Moses, what he says in verses 7 and 8 in the Scripture. Now, why does Moses remove his shoes? It shows, number one, Moses' reverence. Number two, his obedience to the call of God. Matthew Henry in, one of, in his commentary said this, taking off your shoes was a token of respect and submission. Removing your shoes shows doing away with his comfort and rights and willingness to surrender our past, present, and future to a God who does provide. It also symbolizes taking off his shoes before entering a home. And you know as we read the scripture and we think about the history of it, we know they did that and some people still do that now. After being rejected by the Hebrews and also the Egyptians and wandering as a foreigner, Moses finds his true home here with God. And I think about my own life, and I think about people who have come to me and talked to me for counseling, and we all wonder, not W-O-N-D-E-R, we wander away from what God has us to do. Of course, we have our ups and downs, our off and zones. We have experienced heartache and disappointment just like Moses. But I want to tell you one day, are you listening? One day we will be home and we will be face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. In the case of Moses, God establishes his presence and the very ground on which he stands was holy ground. Let me give you a side note here. In the New Testament, Jesus instructed his disciples to, to shake the dust off of their feet at a home where they would not receive the gospel. 
On another occasion, when we're talking about our feet, Jesus washed the disciples' feet. See, Moses knew he was in the presence of someone or something much greater than he was. It is holy ground, friend, because God is there. Anywhere God is, is holy ground. Friend, I've been at the hospital praying for somebody who's about to go out into eternity, and you can sense the presence of God right there. And I knew all of a sudden that I was on holy ground. I've been in a worship service or worship services where the Spirit of God, y'all, is moving in a mighty way, and we realize all of a sudden that this is not us. This is God. And we're standing on holy ground. The Latin word meaning holy is where we get the word sanctuary. A sanctuary means a container for holy things. <laughs> you know, there's nothing holy about this building right here, is it? It only becomes holy ground when God shows up. You witness to somebody during the week, you tell them about the Lord Jesus, and friend, they walk down the aisle and they give their life to Jesus. Friend, that's a holy ground time right there. Well, let me tell you thoroughly this morning, I want you to notice the big turnaround in Moses' life. Moses' life takes an abrupt turn when he encountered a bush burning in the wilderness. God is about to ask him to take on an awesome task. Now, friend, nobody in this building has been asked to do something like Moses was asked to do. He responded, listen, the same way that most of us would have responded. The time is here for Moses. The waiting is over. The timing is to act right now. See, the Mo Moses, the shepherd of Jethro's sheep, will become Moses, the shepherd of God's people. And Moses all of a sudden, sudden says, who am I? You may be saying today, well, who am I? He was raised in the palace, wasn't he? But that was a long time ago. He said, I can't speak. The people will not respect me. And finally in chapter 4, verse 13, he says, Lord, please send someone else. That's just like us. Hey, will you serve in vacation Bible school? Will you be a teacher in the Sunday school? Will you go out and tell somebody about Jesus? We want you to send somebody else. You know, this happens on a personal level and sometimes on a congregational level. God has a plan for your life, doesn't he? I'm glad he's got a direction for our life, just like he had Moses. He has goals for our life because God is in charge and because he is in charge, we can all trust him See, God has the power to accomplish in you what he has called you to do. And that's good news. If God has called you to a certain task, you can be assured all of heaven is behind him and helping you to accomplish the task he has called you to do. Everybody knows what a job is. Everybody in the church has been given a job. Everybody in the church has been, a, been given a gift or gifts of the Holy Spirit. And we are all called on to help free people from being a slave to sin, are we not? So all the pharaohs of this world need to be put on notice. We are the people of God. From the White House to the church house, friend, we are the people of God. We have all the support we need through the Holy Spirit of God and the brothers and sisters in Christ. Friend, do you realize what happened to you when you got saved? 
if you've been saved, the power of the Holy Spirit himself came into your life. Isn't that great? Y'all, isn't that really good? I mean, the Spirit of God comes into our life and he gives us a brand new want to. And he leads us and directs us in the ways of God. He closes the door right in our face and we're not supposed to go that way. We have the Holy Spirit of God in our life and we have brothers and sisters in Christ. Friend, that's us. We make up the body of Christ in the Baptist Church in Hickory, West Tennessee. And we are brothers and sisters in Christ. The only reason God doesn't take us to heaven the moment we become a Christian is that he has left us here with a plan and also a purpose. God is calling every member in this church, every person listening, to step out in faith and say yes this morning to those two words, surrender and commitment. I know we might want to say no, but it's time to say yes. You know what this story in Exodus 3 says? It confirms that God will interrupt a mundane, comfortable life with a calling we do not feel equipped to handle. There are many areas that God's going to lead us to in service. And I would just say to you, say yes. The year is 2022. We're in the month of July. And we're all getting older. Every moment of every day. Our children are growing up too fast. Our grandchildren are growing up too fast. People all around us are dying. The country is on a downhill Swing, and friend, if we're going to say yes to the Holy Spirit of God, we better do it right now because there's coming a time soon and very soon we're going to find out who's the real and who's the false. Who are the ones that will really surrender and keep on surrendering everything to the Lord Jesus Christ? I love that invitation all to Jesus, I surrender. All to him I freely give. Friend, all to Jesus. Everything to Jesus. And just leave it right there at the foot of the cross. I want to know, Hickory with Church, will you be a person that says, Yes, I will surrender? Or will we keep on living a normal, normalized life? Thank the Lord for Moses. Even though he failed many times, look what he became for the kingdom of God. Look what kind of leader he became. Look what he got to do for the kingdom of God. Friend, God is not finished with you yet. He's got so much more that he wants you to do. You just have to say, Lord, here I am. I surrender. Stand with me, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for the man Moses. I thank you, Lord, that you're still speaking to Christians today. And God, you've got something for us to do. Lord, I know that time is running out. The clock is about to, st- to strike 12 midnight. And Father, I pray that we'll be, we'll be about your business. Lord, we'll be totally sold out to you. Yes, Lord, we, we got to take care of our families and our responsibilities of all that you've given to us. But, Lord, we can make you the number one priority in our life. And I pray, God, this week you'll open up all kinds of doors for all of us. And you'll, you'll call our name and you'll use us in a mighty way. And, Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. You surrendered it all. You gave it all. And the least we can do is to give it all back to you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.